Hey, welcome back to Turntable Guy. On the bench today, we got a real beauty. This is a Yamaha YPD71. This is one of their top of the line turntables uh, in a gorgeous veneer. Uh, this kind of walnut veneer. Beautiful. Um, this turntable would match up really nice with the uh, 40 series uh, receivers. Uh, so like the 1040, 840, 640, that line. Uh, beautiful stuff here. Uh, 1242, 10, 10, no, 1040. Uh, oh, 20, 2040. Sorry. So 2040, 1040, 840, 640, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that series would match up uh, perfectly with this unit. This is a gorgeous turntable. Uh, and we're also going to install this Nagaoka MP110, MP110, which is a uh, very high quality cartridge. Um, really good value for the money, although they've gone up in price too. Uh, these used to be around, I don't know, 100, 125 bucks. And I, I can only imagine what they're selling for now. Um, yeah, so this one's come in, uh, nothing serious. Everything works on it. Uh, it is a direct drive quartz locked Yamaha. Now, as far as a manufacturer of this table, um, I'm going to guess CEC again. I don't know how many tables Yamaha actually made in-house, but uh, I don't think this one was made in-house. Um, the only ones I would think that maybe were made in-house were the, were the GT series, but I'm not 100% sure on that either. So anyway, what are we going to do to this one? Not a whole lot. We're going to install that cartridge. We're going to give it just a, a once-over. We're going to set up this very complicated arm. Beautiful, though. Uh, it's uh, an S-shaped, actually it's a J-shaped arm, really. Um, it's got a Grotto cartridge on there right now. Um, it does have vertical uh, height adjustment, which is nice. It's got uh, a really intricate anti-skating device here with the little weight. Um, very beautifully machined. Just it looks spectacular. Um, this is a fully manual turntable table with auto lift. Okay. Uh, let's, uh, let's just give it a quick demonstration here. We'll probably listen to it at the end too, but just to, uh, go over what it does. Let's take off this lid. And I'll just throw a record on there. No sound, just to go over how it functions. Okay, let's zoom in just a little bit. All right, so you have a power on switch here for 33 and 45. So this will not turn on the platter, but you select your speed. I suppose you could leave this in the on position. It doesn't really matter. Uh, and then what you do with this one is you take the arm, you put it over the record. I have to be careful. There's, there's no stylus on this grotto, so I'm not going to let it drop actually. And what you do at that point is you hit play. And it will start the arm in motion and it'll drop very slowly on the record. And then as it plays through and it reaches the end, it will auto lift and it will shut off. That's it as far as functions. There is a cut switch here, but all the cut switch does is lift the tone arm up and shut off the motor. So there's no cueing on this turntable. So when you're actually playing a record, when you your cut is kind of your cueing. So you go, you would have to cut, move it, and then hit play. So that's that's a bit wonky, but other than that, you know, it's it's basically a manual turntable. And uh, like I said, this cartridge doesn't have a needle on it, so I really shouldn't have put that record down. Okay, so we're going to service this. We're going to see what it needs. Like I said, it's not going to need a lot. We'll see if uh, the motor is even accessible and uh, if there's an ability to lubricate it or not. We'll check that out. Um, we're going to set up the arm and we'll uh, install the new cartridge on here. We'll set up uh, vertical tracking alignment, vertical tracking force, anti-skating. Um, I'm going to pause. I'm going to go see if there's a service manual for this turntable and we'll start. So there definitely is a service manual available on Vinyl Engine. Um, it does go into uh, adjusting the quartz oscillator um, if you're having issues with speed. 
Um, as far as I know, this one is not at this point, and it is quartz locking. So hopefully we don't have to do any of that. But um, uh, there are some instructions as to removing the motor and so forth, so I'm hoping that uh, we'll be able to lubricate that. Okay, so we're going to start by removing our... We're going to unplug this and remove our very thick platter mat. And our platter. Looks like there's some strobes on the inside here. Strobe markers. It's got the Yamaha emblem in here. Nice, solid, thick platter. So I'm going to guess that we can have a peek here just to... Uh, if our motor is accessible here. It's the motor cover. Well, that was kind of annoying. Anyway, good I just did that. I'm pretty sure this is going to come straight up, and there we go. All right. Lubrication smells a little bit burned. Uh, 40 or 50 years old and excuse my head I'm just gonna see what's in the pit here there's a little bit of oil left not a lot so you do not need to uh, do anything but to just pull on this it's gonna be a little stuck just because it's been sitting there for so long uh, I'm always concerned about pr pulling plastic parts I do not want to break them I mean, is that motor cover completely necessary? It is in the sense that uh, you don't want the motor coming out if you're pulling up on the platter, right? So, okay, a little bit of alcohol and a paper towel. We're gonna clean the, uh, the axle here. Big magnet here. That's a little dirty. But uh, like I mentioned, the oil was still, at least it hadn't turned to, you know, to glue yet. So, and there is some in there, which is always a good sign. But if you've got the opportunity, get it out and get some fresh, new, modern oils in there. Oil, whatever you have will work, okay? I'm going to go over this once again while I'm cleaning out this uh, bearing pit here. Any kind of oil is better than no oil, okay? You can use, I recommend, like a non-detergent oil. So car engine oil, you can use it if you have it. If that's all you have, it will work. It's not going to destroy anything. But there are additives in car engine oil that may affect this uh, bronze or brass or whatever it is, this, uh, this bushing down here, right? So you definitely want to use something that's non-detergent, and uh, made for electric motors would be the best. I mean, you can use Singer uh, sewing machine oil, which is fine. Um, if you don't have that, I mean, you can use original three-in-one, but it has been known to get a little gummy. So, like I said, any oil is better than no oil. So if, if your pit is dry, get some oil in there. You do not want metal-on-metal -metal friction. What are we going to use today? Well, let's see if this pit's clean. I think it needs a little bit more. We are going to use what I've been using recently, which, which is, is just a, it's three in one uh, specific oil for electric motors. That's what I like to use. It's been, uh, it's been really good. I like the product. It's fairly inexpensive and it's, an av it's available at, uh, most uh, hardware stores. If you're in Canada, you can pick it up at Canadian Tire. It's still a little bit of crap in there, right? Eh? Okay. Good. 
All right, so like I mentioned, uh, where is it? There it is. Uh, I'm just using this. So three and one for electric motors, engineered for quarter horsepower motors or larger. That's not the. That's not necessarily true. You can use it on on uh, motors that are less than a quarter horsepower. And uh, here's the regular stuff that I mentioned, right? So this is just your multi-purpose oil for you know locks, whatever, right? But that one, because if you see here, it says it cleans, so it has some kind of detergent in it, right? You can also use this. So this is just your Singer sewing machine oil. Or you can use a, a non-detergent 30 weight, that would work. Okay. There's no ball bearing in the bottom of this, so two or three drops will do. And then I like to put just a little bit on the axle itself, just like that. And then just let her fall down. And that's what you want to see. You want to see it, you know, you, you want to see some uh, uh, pushback from the oil, but then you want to see it fall down and uh, go down into the pit. If it doesn't go down, then you've over lubricated it. But uh, a lot of times the oil will come out of the pit and then you can uh, get a paper towel and just mop up what uh, what came out. And that is beautiful. So smooth, so quiet, beautifully engineered. Okay, so now we can put this cover back on, which was a bear to take off. So hopefully it's not too much of a bear to put back on. It kind of snaps on. Let's see here, you gotta line up the holes like that. And then, does it? Uh, it just goes around. I guess it was just kind of stuck in place from all the years of just sitting there because it's sitting flat and flush. So, and then you got three little screws to put back. Now we are going to flip the table over and we're going to have a look underneath. And I'm pretty sure this is all the servicing and lubrication service we're going to need on this table because the arm probably operates completely independent from the motor because as it's a, uh, a manual turntable okay so that's that so we're going to take off actually let me uh, let me zoom back up we're going to take off our uh, counterweight And we'll take off our head shell, which is very interesting. All aluminum. And uh, I think we need to take off our, yeah, our anti-skating weight too, because that's going to go banging around when we turn it upside down. So we'll just put that aside. You can see how that works. This cool little uh, little pulley here where it sits on there. It's it's just beautifully machined. Okay, so can we take this out too? Oh, we can take this out. We can take out the uh, that little pulley that holds the uh, anti-skating. This is the arm height adjuster right here. We'll do that later. Okay, let's uh, let's turn this upside down. Definitely want to get a look underneath at this thing. I've never had one of these on the bench before. And just from what I'm seeing, it, it looks like a CEC. The motor looks like a CEC. Okay, that's good. Got a few screws here to take out. These are trusty electric screwdriver which is only on its fourth charge now I've done a uh, Moran 6200 in the past 
I worked on one last night actually and uh, a whole bunch of issues on that one. I didn't film it because I've done the 6200 before, I've done the servicing of it. Um, this one needed new capacitors. They were uh, in really rough condition, which is really rare for, for Rubicon caps. But uh, that was it. I needed that. And then once I was done and I went to test the sound, of course, it needed, um, it needed new cables as well. So I had to put RCA cables on it. It turned out really nice. The last 6200 I worked on was that Nightmare one. It was very, very dirty. If you remember that one, you can check it out. Nice belt drive turntable again, CEC. Man, they made a lot of tables. Holy moly, look how thick this, this bottom is. Holy crap, what is that? Half inch? Half inch thick. Okay, welcome to the bottom of the YPD-71. We have our main board here. Um, a couple micro switches here for 33 and 45 in the bottom corner. Down here. Uh, here's our main board. Got a big thousand microfarad, microfarad 50 volt cap. One, two, three, four, five, six caps on there. And here is our, oh, what is that one? That is our play cut switch here, which goes over here. And here's our tone arm. And uh, under this uh, metal plate is our tone arm connections with big thick cables coming through there. Uh, and it has an optical sensor for the uh, auto return, uh, not the auto return, the auto lift. So once um, the turntable arm comes to a certain point, It'll trip the sensor and it will lift, which is pretty cool. But other than that, um, we have nothing to do under here. Uh, I was noticing that there's a couple test points under here where you can check out the waveform on the quartz uh, oscillator and you can set the quartz speed um, with an oscilloscope. Again, we're not doing that. Speed's good here. So uh, I just wanted you to get a look underneath here and uh, that's the uh, YPD-71 underneath. Very little to do here. So let's uh, let's uh, put that cartridge on together and uh, give this thing uh, a test. Okay, we're back up top. We're going to open up this brand new Nagaoka. The only problem I have with these cartridges is that they are very big. And they do not fit a lot of the vintage head shells. Now, I don't think we have a problem with this Yamaha. It's a pretty big head shell to start with. Uh, but there are some where uh, some tables that have very old fashioned style head shells and uh, the nags just do not go on there. They do not like to play with those. They're impossible to align. So how are we doing there? That's pretty good. All right. Nothing like pulling out a nice new fresh cartridge, eh? What we'll do is uh, we'll download the Yamaha owner's manual too. There is a uh, protractor available for it, but uh, my printer is shot, so I can't print it out. I'm sure there's some kind of uh, specification out there. Anyway, so when you're doing your cartridge, pull your needle off, put it aside somewhere safe. Okay, you do not want that getting damaged. And you're going to take your old cartridge and head shell. This one has no stylus whatsoever. And you're going to want to remove the screws first. That's what I like to do. Some guys like to remove the wires first. It's really up to you.
I'm glad he's uh, removing this Grado, Grado, however you say it. I am not a fan of these. It's nothing personal against Grado. I just think they sound like mud. They have no high end. Now, maybe as you get into their wood bodies or something, you know, people talk, they rave about the mid-range, right? And I guess that's what it's all about with these ones. But uh, I like I like my music well-balanced and, and kind of bright. That's just the way I like it. And uh, the Grotto is by far the worst cartridge for my ears. And that's all just personal opinion, right? Either you like it or you don't, and I don't like them. I bought one to try it out, and I read lots of reviews, and they can hum too, because there's something about the shielding, the bodies. They hum on a lot of turntables. No matter what you do, they, they will make noise. Okay. Oh, here it is. Okay, so hopefully we're going to be okay here, and we are. As you can see, the cartridge has plenty of room to move around in the head. So that's that's good to know and good to see. Excellent. I don't think we'll be using this thing again. That's, that's a bit ugly. I'm gonna use screws and nuts that were provided. Maybe a little screwdriver too. Okay. So I think we don't need the super long screws here. We'd probably do fine with the shorter ones. Okay, and uh, so we'll go with the shorter ones. And what I like to do, I'll get our washer. One washer on a screw. On an open-ended cartridge like this, it works. If it's closed, it doesn't work. So I like to put one screw through and put my nut on. Now you can put the screw on the bottom and have it come out through the top, or you can do the screw through the top and have it go down to the bottom. Your choice. I'm going to do this in real time so you can see how fidgety installing a cartridge can be. And this is one of the beautiful things about cartridges that have uh, threads embedded in the body of the cartridge is that you don't have to screw around with nuts, right? Okay, so this is just long enough. Right there. Wow. So that's perfect. So I'm just going to tighten that up just a little bit. And we'll just move it all the way forward for now. So I can get the second one in. Just like that. Nope. Oh, shit. So now the second one we got to fiddle around with. So I'm going to get it through. And I recommend turning it upside down like this. Laying that nut on top of it. And there's two slots in there. You get a screwdriver in. And uh, use a screwdriver to get threaded. We easily said harder to do. And also, I can't put my head close to the uh, 
to the head shell because then I'll be in the way of the camera. So this is doubly hard. Okay, so we're kind of mounted. I'm just going to move these forward so we can get our wires attached. There. And we'll just tighten them there. And there. And now we can attach our wires. As you can see. I'm going to change glasses. Something with a little bit more magnification here. All right, that's better. Okay. So just uh, wire up your little wires here. These are really kind of scrunched in together. So I like to do the furthest one away from me first, which is white. Very, very white. Right on there. blue and finally our green All right, so we're mounted. So I'm going to just uh, need to download the uh, owner's manual. Uh, these Nagaokas tend to overhang the uh, head shell. That's a normal look for them. Um, probably going to sit somewhere around there is what I'm thinking when it's done. Usually it's around the middle. Uh, but I'm going to just put all this stuff away. I'm going to download that owner's manual and look for an overhang. And I'll be right back. Okay, I did download the owner's manual for the Yamaha. And it uh, states that the overhang for this cartridge is 15 millimeters over the center spindle. So what I've done is I've put a uh, piece of masking tape. So the leading edge here is exactly 15 millimeters from the center of the center spindle. So what we're going to do is we're going to align our cartridge to that point. Now, for those of you who don't want to do it that way, you can use a protractor of your choosing. You're going to need to put your stylus back on for this. We're just going to leave that cartridge ever so slightly loose. Tighten it, but you want it so that it moves just a little bit. So just like that. Okay. And what we're going to do is uh, very gently, very carefully, we're going to move our cartridge and arm over to the center spindle. I like to line it up right in the middle, just like that. And I know you can't see it, but what I'm basically going to do is I am going to move the cartridge back and forth until the needle lines up with the leading edge of that uh, piece of masking tape. And I'm going to change my glasses and uh, I can already see that we're way too far forward. Well, not way too far forward, but too far forward. I'm liking it right there. Okay, so that is, uh, and you can check it. I like to check it with a straight edge, like a razor blade. And what I do is I just put it where the masking tape is and I put it right beside the cartridge. And if the needle's right there, you're good. And we are, we're good. So there you go, there's your 15 millimeter point. And then what you wanna do is put it back and we're going to square it up 
in the head shell. So once we have it perfectly square, now you can do it here or even better is take it off, right? And then you can, uh, first of all, remove the stylus again without moving the cartridge. And then we're just gonna square that up in the head shell and get that nice and squared up, which is right about there. You're gonna lock down those nuts. That's our position. We're nice and square in the head shell. Tighten these nuts and uh, we'll get it back on there and then we'll uh, work on adjusting the arm. Okay, vertical tracking adjustment. Okay, this is the height of the arm in relation to the record. I've got my uh, gauge there and as you, this turntable is kind of annoying because when you turn it off, the arm pops up and there's no automatic, or there's no manual cueing. So you have to press down on the cueing arm just to get it down on the record. Okay, as you can see, we are pretty close right there. What you want is you want that the top of the tone arm to be parallel with the lines behind it. So you're going to need an old record or something like that um, to, uh, to set that up. I'm just going to let go of that. It's going to go back up. To adjust it, what you would do is uh, you basically loosen this knob here and you lift the entire arm up and down. And once you get the desired position, you tighten it down again, but uh, we're good. I've actually been playing with it just a little bit because it'd be impossible to do on camera. And I wanted to show you the uh, the side angle here. And uh, the camera might be distorting the angle itself. It's really hard to see. What's the focus? But it is, according to my eye, pretty good. Okay. So that's the vertical tracking angle. And then we'll be back to set up the uh, vertical tracking force. Okay, according to the manual to set the tracking force, you have to have the turntable moving. Like I said, the arm will not go down if it's not, it's not in the play position. So see so now it will drop. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna balance it. We're gonna get our zero balance, which is the place where the arm is basically floating. Right about there. See if I hit cut, it's going to bring the arm up. So it has to be in play position in order to do this. So once you're balanced, you want to set your weight to zero. And uh, this tracks at 1.75 grams. So turn that to 1.75, which is right there. Um, now there is no, let's put that back. This is one gram, this is 1.5, this is two, this is 2.5 on the anti-skate. I'm gonna leave it in the 1.5 position because that's, I would rather have it a little less anti-skating than more anti-skating. Um, and then, uh, you should be good to go and this arm should be uh, adjusted perfectly. So we've got our vertical tracking adjustment, we've got a vertical tracking force, we've got our anti-skate set, our cartridge is aligned and ready to go. All right, I'm gonna shut that off, we're gonna hit cut, and uh, we'll do a little sound test. Okay, our uh, YPD71 is all set up and ready to rock and roll. We're gonna give it a sound test. Gotta be really careful with these uh, Warner Brunner Brother Records, they nail you for copyright. Nice stereo separation, good bass. These uh, Nagaokas provide a nice punch. I just want to see the auto left work here. Very nice. 
All right, so this one is done. So the arm setup is a little bit more complicated on this deck than other decks. There's quite a bit more to mess with in here. Um, I've actually moved the anti-skating back to the one gram position. Um, I was getting a little bit of, especially when I was doing the lead-out groove, it was just sliding back a little bit. It was providing a little bit too much anti-skate. I found that the one position, it was matching up with this uh, weight a lot better. Um, I'm probably going to play with it a little bit more while I'm off camera here just to make sure everything's set up correctly. But uh, we are set up for 1.75 grams. And the 1.5 position was pulling a little bit too much. So anyway, I'm going to mess with it a little bit more. It is, it is a little bit of a complicated, complicated deck. So um, the arm is very nicely put together, but it has to be set up precisely. And uh, make sure you get your vertical tracking uh, alignment adjusted correctly uh, so you've got the proper tracking angle. All right, so that's another one in the books here. This was the Yamaha YPD71. It's a quartz lock direct drive turntable. Uh, beautiful finish on this one. A lovely manual turntable with an auto lift and a very nice veneer that will match the 40 series of Yamaha receivers. Thanks again, guys. We will catch you in the next video. Bye-bye.